Good evening, this everyone. Will now be recorded. Talking about neonatal respiratory pathophysiology and management. I will be concentrating mostly on neonatal respiratory failure and its pathophysiology. Uh, I will touch upon how to prevent going on to ECMO and maximizing conventional ventilation. Because my topic and Nanda's topic are, are um, inter overlapping. Uh, Nanda will be talking on neonatal ECMO. So that is the reason we felt it is better uh, if we you, you, if we just make sure we we don't talk on the same subject. So coming to that, the uh, the reason why I, I I would like to talk on neonatal respiratory failure is because maybe it is a way I have practiced ECMO for uh, close to two decades. The center in which we practiced was a combined center uh, for both uh, neonatal and pediatric population. For ECMO, numbers are very important. It, it doesn't matter whether it is pediatric or um, adult. So for bringing up the numbers, as the practice is the same for anybody, for any of the ECMO specialist or nurse, it is exactly the uh, same um, practice, but the, the size and the numbers are very important. The more you do, the more it will be your experience. So that is another reason why I would like to uh, make teams in doing ECMO. Uh, Neonatologists as well as pediatric intensivists can help in taking neonatal ECMO forward as well as pediatric ECMO forward, whereas the adult group can help in uh, uh, doing adult ECMO. So we, with that uh, principle in my mind, we established the center. So the structure is very important. And they work very well. Everyone knows how to do it. They call it, call it, call it. They call it, call it. They call it, call it. Because what happened to me? I don't know. Hello? 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 So that's about the neonatal ECMO. Uh, and the need for understanding it in all age groups, the neon, uh, neonatologists, pediatricians, and adult physicians also should understand this because we all come from the same background. Some of the common neonatal conditions when ECMO is needed is meconium aspiration syndrome, persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, sepsis or pneumonia, respiratory distress syndrome in term babies or near term babies uh, that is beyond 35 weeks period of gestation when it is not responding to uh, surfactant alone air leak syndromes and cardiac anomalies pre and post operative cardiac stabilization aspect know which are the diseases that are not amenable to ECMO uh, once a child is on uh, ECMO but not showing improvement there is a specified period within which neonates usually respond uh, once they're getting better but if you see them non not responding within that specified period that uh, is a reason for raising the eyebrows and we have to start investigating laterally could it be one of these like bronchopulmonary dysplasia, lymphangiectasia, congenital surfactant deficiencies, alveolar capillary dysplasia, etc. So these are characterized by the fact that the damage is not reversible. So that is the reason uh, we don't want to put these patients on ECMO. God has made the 
lung units very specific for uh, human beings and animal species as well. Uh, without this gas exchange units, it will be very difficult for anybody to survive. It is impossible to survive. So we need to understand a little bit more about genesis of lungs in the fetal period. This is because we have to find the keys where we lost them. Once we understand the physiology and pathophysiology, how things have been changing in the disease process, that helps us to go back to physiology and bring the physiology back once again. On this uh, exceptionally beautiful slide from research gate, we see the normal alveolus on one side and injured alveolus on the other side. In the normal alveolus, you see the lining of the alveolus over here, type 2 cells, which are surfactant producing cells, which are very, very important. And you see thin lining of surfactant, which makes the alveolus resistant to collapse. There are very few alveolar macrophages inside. And interstitium is very important. It is thin and it is easy for the gas uh, to get transferred from the alveolus to the capillary space. And you look at the capillary space as well, which is very healthy. Uh, RBC are floating in that. They are able to go without any uh, stagnation in, in the capillary. Okay, this is the normal alveolus. And the unit itself, alveolus and the capillary here with the interstitium in between. And once the disease process sets in, for example, pneumonia, see how it is changing to a hyaline membrane forming over here, the alveolar membrane disappear, alveolar lining disappearing, uh, intact type 2 cells, they are injured, their the production of surfactant may not be as good as it used to be before. Uh, RBC and the neutrophil cytokines, everything getting infiltrated in the alveolar um, uh, alveolar space. So there is alveolar edema at this point of time. Um, also, in the interstitium, the interstitium is getting widened here. Um, fibrosis and procollagen uh, fibers stop to get accumulated. Um, the capillary junctions become widened. So the neutrophils percolate into the capillary space here. There is leakage uh, from the uh, capillary space as well into the interstitium. So is there any wonder in thinking that uh, in, a, in a full, uh, it takes time for this uh, pneumonic process to resolve, lungs have to come back to this beautiful picture of, uh, of normal alveolus as before. So it takes time. The reason why we survive is uh, it depends on how many how many alveoli in disease process are affected. So if it is close to uh, nearly 80% and 90% alveoli which are getting affected, probably there is no other way other than going for a ECMO at that stage. But uh, up to 80% or some sort of number like that. Um, Ventilation may still be able to work with uh, higher percentage of oxygen, higher pressures, etc. in those regions. Uh, when you, the number of alveolar units which are damaged are less uh, compared to the number of functioning units, it is better without needing any support just on alveolar, just on antibiotics if it is a bacterial infection, uh, plus chest physio, etc. So the same thing is being shown here for the normal alveolus. And this is a distribution of the uh, surfactants within the alveolus here. And uh, remember this part, uh, part C of the picture, which shows, ultra, which shows the electron micrographic picture of a uh, rat lung showing the lamellar bodies over here. In certain alveolar uh, problems, such as uh, surfactant protein deficiencies, we see varying shapes of the lamellar bodies on, uh, on uh, electron microscopy picture. I'm going to touch upon that uh, uh, 
or subsequently so the development of the lung by itself we are seeing the first part here uh, in the embryonic period four to seven weeks and bronchi then pseudo glandular formation and canalicular formation so the stage of viability from 27 36 weeks at this stage beyond that 24 weeks period of gestation here the lung is still in the uh, saccular form alveoli uh, have not developed very well here or in, in a very prim in a primitive stage at that time once the child is passing into 35 weeks 36 weeks then the alveoli tend to form and uh, mature afterwards and this maturation continues till two years of age here the expansion of the gas exchange area nerves and capillaries it continues till two years and even further this is what Bob keeps on saying nowadays. Uh, your alveolar development, everything is uh, is a reversible process. Uh, that you, uh, with the onset of fibrosis, probably we need longer period of time to recovery. Uh, if we in our developing or resource limited countries, it may be difficult for us to wait for longer period of time. Um, but if you can wait for longer period of time, lung recovery is still possible in uh, all the cases um, that is what bob barlett has been saying off late so the importance of this uh, picture is from 27 weeks onwards when the canalicular phase here and micro alveoli formation here very small alveoli and the small alveoli start to get bigger and bigger this uh, the other important factor is the mature alveolar formation it doesn't stop at that level Still, this uh, uh, proliferation and expansion of the alveoli will continue uh, in the early childhood also. So, uh, that is important to recognize at this phase. So, this is a close uh, image of uh, alveolus. You can see the type 2 alveolar cells here secreting surfactant. This is the lining of the surfactant here, the blue one, one in blue color with few alveolar macrophages and uh, uh, the air space with uh, very thin uh, alveolar lining here. So the pathophysiology is let us understand what is happening in different diseases uh, affecting the newborn. Respiratory distress syndrome, it is a lack of surf surfactant production. So we tend to give artificial surfactants as a supplementation uh, many babies do get better, but some babies don't get better even after supplementation with the surfactant. And if those ones are uh, above 34 weeks gestation or 35 weeks gestation, then we, we should be able to offer them ECMO therapy. The next and the most important cause is meconium aspiration syndrome. Many of you might have come across meconium aspiration, which causes mechanical obstruction to the uh, alveolus as well as uh, uh, bronchiolar as well as bronchial lumens. So this meconium has to be cleared. Uh, the pathology is entirely different here. Despite the fact that there are matured alveoli, a foreign substance is going to block alveoli as well as uh, bronchioles. The other picture is pneumonias. Here the pathology is different as we were talking uh, earlier. Heterogeneous picture uh, and the consolidation process, alveolar uh, lumen getting filled up with uh, uh, bacterial products as well as uh, the intended products from the body which are going to uh, lie down in uh, alveolar spaces trying to clear up like neutro, uh, neutrophils, cytokines, etc. Uh, the most important thing to remember is this is a heterogeneous process. Other important criteria is the hyperplasia of the endothelium in uh, uh, persisting pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension could be a varying reasons, but this is just a uh, uh, persistence of the endothelium and hyperplasia of the endothelium 
which is commonly seen in this picture one of these examples is again um, congenital diaphragmatic hernia barotrauma fibrosis in ehrlich syndrome that is another pathology which we tend to see here respiratory distress syndrome surfactant deficiency surfactant is a mixture of lipids and protein secreted by type 2 alveolar cells phosphatidylcholine is 80% of this and anionic phosphatidylglycerol and cholesterol are 10% each uh, if there is a surfactant membrane which is lining the alveolus then the alveolus is like what you are seeing on your right side uh, leading to expansion of the alveolus and it doesn't allow the alveolus to collapse on its own so there is a gas exchange taking place in a healthy way to the right side compared to the left side where there is collapse of the alveolus due to deficiency of the surfactant at that level so the pathophysiology of the second important factor is the multiple hernia besides uh, um, airway obstruction which is being caused mechanically the other things are altered lung elastic forces by increasing resistance reducing compliance alveolar and parenchymal inflammation and edema effects of the mediators like cytokines surfactant dysfunction protein leak into the airways direct toxicity of the meconium itself pulmonary vasoconstriction due to components of meconium altered pulmonary reactive vaso reactivity and effects are in utero hypoxemia so there are multiple things happening over here it is not only mechanical problem though the mechanical problem uh, started or triggered by meconium is a starting point there are so many things happening here in that uh, alveolus representation of uh, alveolus getting filled up with foreign particles as a result of the aspiration of any kind of stuff in that that is a pathophysiology in meconium aspiration syndrome coming to pneumonia if you uh, take a histopathological examination here uh, it looks like the picture you are seeing on the right side some of the alveoli they have completely collapsed with neutrophilic uh, um, infiltration into them and thickening of uh, uh, fibrous walls within depending on the uh, time duration uh, the patient has been in pneumonic process and you can see the macroscopic appearance of a pneumonic uh, consolidation process how it looks like in a consolidated lung i'm sure you all know about this the consolidated lung has been described as uh, genus of it looks like liver when you hold it in hand it is as hard as liver when it is consolidated so some of the radiographic pictures of meconium aspiration syndrome um, here to show you how um, it, it can go up to the final picture shown here as well like complete white out of the lung without any air going into this but generally this happens when the patient goes on to ecmo Uh, but before that the lung could manifest with any of the features you are seeing in these four x-rays meconium aspiration syndrome cannot be completely avoided uh, because this can happen in utero as well and you can see meconium in the lungs when it happens in utero as a result of the hypoxia so this is uh, my my the presence of meconium here these these blocks are the ones in orange color those are the meconium flux seen inside within the alveolar lumen similarly uh, there is another picture histology showing decrease in the air space and pulmonary hyperplasia in congenital diaphragmatic hernia group uh, here uh, you see the air space on the left side here but on the right side you can see much reduced air space uh, in in the lung as such this is alveolar capillary dysplasia i'm going to touch upon slightly towards the end of my presentation as well 
as the name implies alveolo capillary dysplasia with malalignment of the pulmonary veins at certain places you will see the alveoli at places you will see the blood vessels now normally you would uh, like to see all the alveoli surrounded with the capillaries but in this particular picture uh, veins will be at one one place and capillaries uh, they are isolated and they are not not completely surrounding the alveolus but this is a heterogeneous picture as well at certain part of the lung it can look like a complete like like there is there is no collaboration between the alveoli and capillary but in some parts of the lung there may be uh, some uh, interaction going on between alveoli and capillaries this is a condition which is incompatible with life so if our patients placed on ecmo they are not re responding uh, to e ecmo or they respond to ecmo but you cannot take them off ecmo that will be the problem here even if you go for a decannulation they will be needing recannulation once again or ecmo support once again so in those conditions once you diagnose those conditions you won't be offering them we ecmo i have dealt with uh, nearly four to five cases of uh, alveolar capillary dysplasia so this is the photomicrograph uh, showing hyperplasia of the um, and uh, of this uh, bronchiolar smooth muscle how it is like the and and also the vascular lumens here they are hyper they are they are uh, they have hypertrophied and um, they are multiplied as well like hyperplasia in pulmonary hypertension this will be the picture you are expecting to see in the developmental developing alveoli look like this and uh, again hyperplasia with uh, hyperplasia of the uh, vascular smooth muscle it is a high power picture with the infiltration within the lumen and hyperplasia of the uh, alveolar lining here the neonatal ecmo referral criteria are oxygenation index of more than 40 Oxygenation mean air pressure is FeO2 divided by PeO2. If the oxygenation is more than 40 for more than four hours, that correlates with 80% mortality. Other ways to measure failure are arterial partial pressure of oxygen of less than 50 millimeter per hour. to show you how the lung looks like uh, one of the severely affected condition and a baby you know we we know sex and we know our people like oh so just a few slides on surfactant protein deficiency and alveolar dysplasia surfactant protein b deficiency with the uh, loss of functional limitations in surfactant proteins uh, it is lethal in the newborn period you can see three different types of surfactant protein uh, deficiency surfactant protein b deficiency is the autosomal recessive condition it is lethal though uh, bronchioalveolar lavage can be done uh, for uh, biochemical analysis but still um, We, these days we tend to go for genetic diagnosis as it is to tell it is surfactant protein b deficiency so genetic diagnosis is the ultimate surfactant protein c disease is compatible with life it can present any time from birth to adulthood uh, and its presentation is variable as well it may have cytoplasmic dense aggregates Uh, so yeah, the uh, supportive care and lung transplantation, if it is progressing, that is the treatment of choice. And APCA three deficiency can present from birth to childhood period, autosomal recessive as well. And uh, diagnosis is from tracheal aspirate sequence of uh, APCA three. Electron microscopy picture showing small dense lamellar bodies and consider lung 
transplantation if that is a presentation surfactant and protein b deficiency is an autosomal recessive disorder vaccinate Uh, approximately one per million live births uh, seen in term newborns severe respiratory failure needing ventilation and not responding to ventilation even resulting in need for ecmo prolonged ecmo course is the uh, problem here and they won't be able to tolerate even once they are decangulated pulmonary hypertension which may be responsible to responsive to nitric oxide is another thing Briefly about the microscopy, these features include alveolar type 2 cell hyperplasia, interstitial thickening under fibrosis, and areas of alveolar proteinosis. So it needs lung biopsy for uh, confirmation. But as lung biopsy is an in invasive procedure, um, we tend to go for genetic diagnosis for uh, diagnostic accuracy. So this is how a picture of a uh, Effect and protein B deficiency looks like. The genetic diagnosis is INS2 protein mutation. Uh, this is the diagnostic test which is associated with approximately 70% of the cases of surfactant and protein B deficiency. So the treatment is uh, lung transplantation. There are early trials being done with the gene therapy, but it is not in in uh, offering process right now. it is possible to treat them with the gene therapy in future um, the other problem is uh, alveolo capillary dysplasia which is another congenital condition not uh, amenable to ecmo it needs ecmo but the children will not be able to survive without ecmo multiple congenital non lethal anomalies help in diagnosing this picture i have seen children with microphthalmia and anophthalmia these are the described patterns of recognition duodenal atresia anorectal anomalies intestinal mal rotation and total colonic hashbrons uh, disease they can be associated with uh, alveolar capillary dysplasia some cardiovascular problems urogenital and musculoskeletal musculoskeletal system problems could be associated with this as well it is uh, A small as an alignment of pulmonary veins, as I told you earlier and showed the pictures, it presents as persisting pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, unresponsive to treatment. You can see vascular bundles at some place and alveolar or at other place, uh, which are unassociated with capillaries surrounding them. Veins at one place here on the top and bronchioles at a different place are. there is a complete dissociation of alveoli and capillaries along with bigger vascular bundles in this uh, anomaly that is the reason it is incompatible with life lung transplantation in western countries people do advise but there is significant mortality and morbidity uh, subsequent to neonatal lung transplantation a pre pre transplant mortality rate up to 30% and 40 to 50 percent five year survival rate so they have prompted nearly uh, half the families of affected children to decline transplantation and choose compassionate care in those cases which are diagnosed with uh, either surfactant protein b deficiency or alveolar capillary dysplasia so that is the current stay at this point of time so this is my last slide um nanda asked me to talk a little bit about prevention the prevention is by maximizing conventional ventilation in cases of meconium aspiration syndrome surfactant uh, um, rds or uh, retin or uh, respiratory distress syndrome like features so rest of the features uh, there may not be much to do with the prevention itself lung protective ventilation in uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia and not causing lung trauma in those cases accepting um, permissive hypercarbia strategies in these cases in western countries once nitric oxide became available uh, over there the major comment is like uh, they, they don't need to resort to ecmo but my gut feeling is though there is some contribution from 
um, nitric oxide and the uh, high, uh, high frequency oscillatory ventilation in reducing the need for ECMO. Uh, probably to do with best obstetric care or perinatal care. If the neonates are looked after very well soon after birth, uh, even though they have aspirated uh, meconium, uh, a majority of them can be saved from the ill effects of uh, meconium aspiration syndrome by removing this stuff from the major bronchi and bronchioles to some extent. From the alveoli, you may not be able to remove it completely, but proportionality does help in making these babies uh, respond sooner. We tried with this in uh, UK uh, by not putting them on ECMO, our results are they needed high pressure ventilation and nitric oxide ventilation for nearly 15 to 20 days compared to a baby who was put on ECMO getting decannulated by day five. So the morbidity and mortality was significantly less in children who have gone on to ECMO. That is the reason we preferred going on to ECMO when there is a, a borderline case or severely affected case. Uh, definitely we have chosen ECMO route because the pulmonary barotrauma was negligible in these children. Uh, they needed ECMO for a period of 48 to 72 hours and uh, then one day more of uh, conventional ventilation. Next day they will be uh, extubated and ready to get discharged with that. So in those setup, definitely we preferred ECMO and which was very, very helpful. Uh, before I recommend that, I certainly feel one should get the proficiency in doing ECMO and definitely that is a worthwhile practice to do. So we like to end my talk here and invite any questions if they are. I'm very happy to answer if you have any questions. Hello? 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 Okay. Are there any questions? Oh, sir. Hi, Vinkar. Hello, sir. Uh, any questions, please? If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Should I go to Dr. Nanda's talk? Yes. Nanda? Yes, Sunil. Yes, yeah. Shall I start? Yes, you can start, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is my voice okay, sir? Voice okay. Kindly share yes, your webcam, webcam. Share your webcam. Right. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, sir. The resound, resound is coming. Sound is uh, audible to us, sir. Audible to us. Okay, fine, sir. Continue that. So, so yeah, thank you, yeah, Sunil. Thank you. That was really good. Uh, a very good preparation for the next uh, talk. So, what I thought was my talk. So, introduce a clinical scenario where ECMO was useful for a neonate. And then talk about indications when you think you uh, indicate. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Voice is Voice not clear. Is not clear. 
Okay, voice is not clear. Maybe if I disconnect the webcam, it might. Okay, okay, okay. You can do that, sir. Okay. Is it better now, sir? Sir, echoes are coming back to back. If we don't talk, you will be okay, um, Nanda. We are muting our our uh, phones also. Okay. Is it better, sir? Yes, sir. Now yes. it is better. Okay. So the the overall uh, uh, talk would be to start with a clinical scenario. And then uh, talk about uh, indications when do you think uh, ECMO in neonatal uh, uh, population and a specific challenge which are pertaining to neonatal neonates uh, compared to adults. And then finally talk about the what are the outcomes and evidence. So here is a uh, primary mother with uncomplicated pregnancy went into labor. Meconium was noted at the time of birth, but the baby came out crying after birth but started to develop respiratory disease within 10 minutes of life. So from there, child was referred to a children's hospital where baby was put on a CPAP and then with the respiratory distress was not getting better. So the therapy got escalated up to ventilation then high frequency ventilation. And then they suspected a, a persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. So, and did a curve which confirmed the severe uh, PPHN with a right to left shin through the PDA. So this is an X-ray, which shows a very kind of non-aerated lungs. So at this stage, baby was transferred to us because to give a trial of inhaled nitric oxide. So we tried the inhaled nitric oxide. Baby got stabilized for a few hours, but then slowly things were getting worse, and the ventilator requirement just started to go up. So we gave surfactant also, as uh, Sunil said, mentioned about uh, meconium aspiration. So you can get surfactant uh, inactivation. So sometimes surfactant, giving surfactant might help. So that did not make much difference. Oxygen index at that time was 33. And the uh, child also had uh, hemodynamic compromise on, uh, so went on to inotropes. So this was X-ray on high frequency, which not much different compared to the uh, earlier x-ray and these are the serial blood gases uh, arterial blood gases which showed uh, uh, acidosis was getting worse and then CO2 was slowly building up and also lactate was slowly started to go up so at this point so baby was in high frequency very high settings 100 percent oxygen and inhaled nitric oxide was going on so we considered uh, ECMA at that point of the time because the things were slowly going off the edge. So, so how do we do it? So we do we drain the blood from deoxygenated blood from the pulmonary circulation with the help of a motor pump and pump it through the um, membrane oxygenator where the gas exchange happens and the oxygenated blood is uh, pumped back into the uh, baby's circulation. The common indications are like either it could be primary respiratory, uh, either cardiac or a combination of cardiorespiratory failure. The very common indications in respiratory failure are pneumonia, a meconium aspiration syndrome, or with or without uh, persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. Another in the common indication which is coming up now is a diaphragmatic hernia. And the cardiac ones are uh, myocarditis, uh, cardiomyopathy, or uh, post cardiac surgery. Baby, baby is unable to come off uh, cardiac pulmonary bypass. And in some situations, like especially with the uh, fulminant sepsis, you can have a both combination of a, a respiratory and cardiac failure. So what time, you, like uh, what point of the support you consider ECMO is, uh, as I think Sunil said already touched upon these things, when oxygen index is more than 40 uh, for four hours, which almost equal into more than 80% of the mortality. Uh, and adult uh, intensivists, they usually calculate PF ratio, which is uh, arterial uh, oxygenation compared to the fraction of oxygen is given to, to the patient. 
But the problem with that is it doesn't take into account how much ventilator support the patient is needing. So in that situation, so oxygen is index is useful, but it also takes into account of how much to support patient is needing to maintain that uh, arterial oxygen saturations. So if oxygen induction is more than 40, I think one should consider ECMO, but uh, even before patient goes more than 40, I think we should think about it and maybe shift the patient to a center where the ECMO is available. <clears throat> in other situations where the patient is on 100% oxygen, and despite that, uh, you're not able to come down on the FIOT even after 48 hours, and then one should really consider ECMO. Uh, severe hypoxemia, that equivalent to uh, arterial oxygen um, content less than 40 and unresponse to any intervention. Or a severe pulmonary hypertension with RV dysfunction like a persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn or a pressure resistant uh, hypertension. So baby is already on more than two inotropes and with that, hypertension is not getting better, or the rate of deterioration is too fast, uh, then one should really consider early on. And sometimes you have to actually sit at uh, bedside and decide case by case uh, uh, to see which patient is going to get benefit and uh, when is the right time to initiate ECMO. And then some contraindications, uh, uh, some of them are absolute, like uh, lethal chromosomal abnormalities where trisomy 13 or 18, where uh, outcome is going to be really bad. Trisomy 21 is not a contraindication. That is, Down syndrome is not a contraindication. It used to be a contraindication um, in the very beginning, but no more is contraindication. Your Down, Down syndrome children are actually growing up into adulthood as well. So it's not a contraindication. Or if the, a baby has a severe irreversible neurological damage, like a, a, a grade three or grade four intermental hemorrhage, or a sustained a significant neurological um, insult with uh, uh, brain death situation, in those uh, conditions, ECMO is better not offered. There's some relative contraindications like a birth weight less than two kilos. This is mainly because uh, the, we are unable to have a cannula uh, to support the circulatory system in less than two kilo baby. That is the reason. Uh, gestation is less than 34 weeks. Again, this is because the risk of interventional hemorrhage is very high in preterm babies. And uh, less than 34 weeks, the risk is very high with uh, any form of anticoagulation. And uh, some related contraindications indications are uh, duration of pre-ECMO ventilation more than 14 days. Uh, that is high pressure ventilation, uh, more than 14 days. The risk of reducible fibrosis would uh, set in in the lungs and the initiating ECMO at that point of the time may not be a good idea. Or irreversible organ damage with a poor long-term prognosis also relative contraindication. So if in those situations, maybe if you're not sure, get in touch with the uh, other centers who they've been doing it, or maybe get in touch with ELSO or a registry where they can guide with uh, whether we can consider ECMO or not. But whatever it is, the pathology should be reversible and the conventional treatment has to be exhausted because ECMO is one of the most invasive modes of treatment. So one has to try with all not, less invasive modes of treatment before considering ECMO and the pathology has to be reversible. But when you're considering an ECMO, consider early on, as Dr. Sunil said, don't wait for the uh, organ damage to happen. So how is it done? So we discussed that. So, so let me introduce this, the components of ECMO circuit. So the really ma four major components are there in the ECMO circuit. Cannulas, pump, uh, membrane oxygenator, and conduit tubes. So, so we'll discuss about a few specifics for the neonates in these, each one of these things. Uh, so when you think about cannulas, ECMO modes can be divided into veno-venous or veno-arterial mode. A veno-venous mode means both the drainage cannula and the return cannula are into the venous side of the circulation and is a primary mode of respiratory support. And for it to be effective, the baby heart function has to be good. Venous arterial mode means uh, you drain it from the venous side of circulation, but return into the arterial uh, circulation. And uh, in that way, you can support both heart and lungs. So we have a combined cardiorespiratory failure, a heart failure, a primary heart failure, and venous arterial mode of ECMO is useful. So this is a venous venous mode of ECMO done. So where the, you have a single cannula with two lumens, where the uh, baby is cannulated through the internal jugular vein uh, into the right atrium. And this is how the cannula looks with uh, uh, two 
This is a single cannula with two lumens. And this is how the cannula is inserted into the uh, internal jugular, SVC, right atrium, right up to the IVC. And this is how it works. So this cannula is called Avalon cannula is uh, particularly designed for this uh, ECMO, uh, for ECMO cannulation. So the way it works is basically you have a drainage port in the in inferior vena cava and then superior vena cava where the blood gets drained to the circuit and the oxygenated blood is returned in the middle where it sits across the right opposite to the tricuspid valve. So for it to be effective, this cannula has to be inserted in a particular way and the, uh, probably under the echo, uh, uh, echo guidance or in the cath lab guidance. So for it to be effective, this has to be the position. So this is a vena venous mode of ECMO with the two um, cannulas. This is typically used in adult patients or bigger children where the drainage cannula is in the IVC and the written cannula is in the uh, superior vena cava. But we cannot use this in a neonates mainly because uh, femoral vessels are not developed in uh, children who are not started to walk yet. And the neonates are more so. So we cannot use two cannula technique for respiratory support in neonates. So if you do not have a cannula like this, which is not available in India as of now, so what we've been doing is going for veno arterial mode of ECMO, even the indication is respiratory. So in this, what we do is, we put a drainage cannula from the internal jugular SVC into right atrium, and the return cannula to the common carotid into the arch of iota. So this is how veno arterial mode of ECMO is done in uh, children. Uh, in, ne in, sorry, in neonates. So this is a baby we did it. The earlier baby we talked about went on ECMO. So this is two cannulas are there. Uh, and if you can see the, on the X-ray, so this is a drainage cannula, which is from the internal jugular SVC into the right atrium. Actually, this is around uh, 14 uh, French cannula. And this is the return cannula, which is from the common carotid into the arch of iota. And this is an endotracheal tube. So in terms of cannula specific, if you're going for a single cannula, like what we talked about, Avalon cannula, 13 French or 16 French are useful depending on the birth weight of the baby. Uh, for, but our situations probably, we don't have a single, a double lumen single cannula, this one. So we might have to go for a vena arterial mode of ECMO. So if you're going for that, uh, so uh, venous cannula anywhere between eight French to 14 French, we can use depending on the baby weight. Uh, if the baby is around three kilos, more than three kilos, probably we can go for a 14 French. The return cannula anywhere between eight to 10 French would be a um, good one. See, other uh, specific issues for the neonates is uh, uh, we cannot, is, I mean, it's difficult to do percutaneous cannulation. So we might have to do a, a cut down uh, exposure of the vessels and uh, cannulate the vessels under direct vision. And this also actually helps us to uh, measure the, uh, see the can uh, whistle size and choose appropriate size cannula. Uh, and then generally what we do it for, go for is a semi-cell ringer technique where we cut open the whistles and, but when you cannulate through a, like a cell ringer technique. And the other important aspect of the uh, neonatal cannulation is securing the cannula. So the baby like this, where the arterial cannula is here is, Length of the arterial cannula inside the from the skin to into the arch of iota is around three to four centimeters. So the very very less length is in, in the uh, baby. And if you look at it, the lot of it is outside, and the bigger portion is outside, which is actually quite heavy compared to the cannula. So one need to be really careful how you secure the cannulas. So that's even more reason to have a surgical cut down and secure the cannulas very well. Okay. So repair of the vessels when especially if you cannulate the carotids, so uh, the two methods, either you can ligate the carotid completely when it, at the time of decannulation, or some surgeons prefers to uh, repair the vessel. But there's no difference in the outcome, whichever way you do it is up to the surgical preference. We cannot consider uh, uh, cannulating the carotid in adults because of the increased risk of uh, Cardiovascular, cerebrovascular accident, and the neonate being uh, vessels are not that much atherosclerotic and the circular villus is patent, so risk of uh, cerebrovascular accident is not that much compared to adults. 
And the tubing, what we're using for neonates is one fourth to, uh, inch tubing compared to three eighth tubing in adults. Another important aspect is in neonates is uh, priming volume. Uh, volume. Uh, the, in, the priming volume of ECMO circuit is anywhere between uh, uh, 400 to 500 ml of uh, blood, uh, which is much, is almost a double the capacity or double the volume of the neonatal intra intravascular volume. So for that reason, whenever we go on ECMO, we always do a, a blood priming of the circuit. Uh, and then when we do a blood priming, we need to really make sure that we don't have high, very high hematocrit, not use a very old blood, and we we'll do a blood gas before connecting the ECMO circuit to the patient, make sure that the blood gas, comp uh, blood gas and electrolyte uh, is in comparison with the baby's values. Otherwise, there's a risk of a metabolic abnormalities would be very high because just simply because the priming volume is uh, almost double the uh, volume of the uh, baby's uh, intravascular volume. In coming to oxygenator, so there's a separate oxygenator for the babies. Uh, if you go for the Maki uh, oxygenator, there are only two oxygenators available, adult and a pediatric, that which can be used for the neonates as well. But if you go to Medos, there's uh, three different sizes are there, one for the neonate, pediatric and adults. The specific for one neonates, is, uh, if you're going for think of neonates, are used for the, the one used for the neonatal one. And usually the flow we can get from the neonatal one is around two liters maximum flow what we can get is. If, if you come to pump heads, um, there's no difference whether it's for the adults, pediatric and neonates, it's the same pump head for all the age groups. So when it comes to essential aspects of the ECMO anticoagulation, which I'll discuss in the next slide, or the specific issues for the neonates. So these babies, so when we do a lot of sampling also, so they need a lot of uh, uh, blood products and uh, blood transfusion as well. Because even when the blood uh, sampling, what we do, we need to document that as a part of the uh, input output charts, make sure that we're not taking too much blood out. Another important aspect is uh, whenever the, re the water, the reason we're going on ECMO is to give the risk to the lungs. So make sure the lungs are rested well and then, and then give time for the lungs to recover. Uh, so one aspect I want to touch is that if the saturations are 80 and above, so that's okay. So rather than chasing up the saturations to go up to more than 95 or something. So you don't need to aim for the normal saturations, more than 80 saturations provided there's no Oh, acidosis is developing, lactate clearance is good, that is good enough, and you don't need to chase up the increasing the PAO2 with going up on the ventilator. So make sure the lungs are rested well and make sure the good lung toileting is done and good ICU control, and especially, especially infection control measures. So anticoagulation heparin is the by default we use uh, for the anticoagulation, and usually monitored by the uh, ACT and uh, APTT both, and some units in the Western countries, they're going with the anti-factor 10A levels. Um, if you somebody, some of you listen to Dr. L uh, Lakshmi Raman's talk, so in their units, they use anti-factor 10A, but we don't have facilities in India as of now, so we're going with uh, AC and APTT uh, combination. And if you have a problem, and uh, if there's a baby is bleeding especially, then we go for a, a TEG, thromboelastogram. The specific situation for the neonates are uh, their uh, coagulation system is immature and then physiological APTT is prolonged. So even these APTT is prolonged, we still aim for APTT range between uh, 60 to 80. Yeah. Other uh, uh, important uh, thing is antithrombin. Uh, so heparin acts through the antithrombin, um, uh, aggravating the antithrombin activity. So neonates already have antithrombin low levels and uh, for, if it further level goes down further down and the heparin may not be that effective. In those situations, uh, uh, in Western countries, they measure the antithrombin uh, levels and if it is low, they give concentrate. But for our situations, we cannot do that. So what we do is if the heparin requirement is going up steadily high, more than uh, 50 units per kilo per hour, and then give a, a, a FFP, which has some amount of antithrombin. So, if the apparent requirement is going up, up and up uh, steadily, then you think of giving uh, FFP uh, infusion. Another aspect is uh, 
heparin induced thrombocytopenia is extremely rare in neonates. Uh, unlike adults, it's probably to a certain extent it's common in adults, but in neonates is very extremely rare. So you don't need to worry about that. So if there's a baby develops a thrombocytopenia on heparin, I think you need to really think about any secondary uh, sepsis developing rather than uh, uh, HIT. So this is a baby uh, we talked about on ECMO. They're here and the ECMO circuit um, going on. So this is an oxygenator, this is a pump and the ECMO console here. So this is a baby awake on ECMO. So just want to show the uh, circuit what we did. So Okay, so this one thing, so this is a baby here, then there is the two cannulas here, and this is a bridge. So this baby went on venoarterial arterial mode of ECMO, and this is a bridge, and this is actually at the time of uh, coming, uh, giving a trial of ECMO. So we connected a bridge so that we can, we clamped uh, both cannulas. So baby is off from ECMO, and then circuit is being run through the bridge to, to keep it patent. In case baby would not tolerate, which baby actually did not tolerate, we went on, uh, unclamping this and clamping the circuit, so baby went on ECMO. So that's a, a bridge there, and so there's the two cannulas. Sorry, two. Um, the blue one is the drainage one, the red one, red straps one, the written um, circuit. So membrane oxygenator and the oxygen which is connected there, here, sweet gas. There's a pump head. And there's a console. So around 0.76 liters per minute flow is going through the circuit. Sorry. Okay, so this is another baby, not our baby, this is another baby um, where it's been reported where you can actually even consider awake ECMO. So this is a baby with a, a significant aid leak syndrome went on ECMO for that reason. And they couldn't ventilate because whatever the form of the ventilation, there was a, a pneumothorax was recurrent. So they had actually extubated the baby on ECMO. Uh, and they were trying to feed the baby. So awake ECMO, not only for adults, even we can consider for neonates, but in a specific situations. So coming to complications, uh, I'll say the complication like any other um, ECMO patient. So we'll touch upon few aspects, uh, which is bleeding. So risk of IVH is significantly high in uh, newborn babies, and if you're preterm babies, even more high. So for the baby, we put on ECMO, so baby developed uh, IVH uh, up to grade two, uh, which wasn't there. So usually what we do is, uh, when the baby goes on ECMO, we do a daily neurosonogram, make sure that the IV, so interventional hemorrhage is not developing. So we, this baby, particular baby developed up to uh, interventional grade two. We grade interventional hemorrhage up to grade one to four. Uh, grade four, grade one being uh, the beginning one, and grade four being the significant uh, bleed with a, a interparenchymal extension. So this is baby uh, grade two means the uh, bleeding is only confined to the lateral ventricles. So in those situations, what we do is uh, we run the lower ACTs, or sometimes maybe heparin free, depending on the coagulation situation and how circuit is. Uh, uh, and how old is the circuit? So our particular baby, we ran low ACTs and uh, low heparin. And luckily bleed did not increase, but if the bleed goes increases to grade three, or especially grade four, you really need to think of coming off ECMO. Okay, so that's about it. So coming to evidence. Um, so actually, if you look at the ECMO history, ECMO has actually started for the neonates as a standard of care. Um, and the only randomized control trial was done in neonates only so far. Uh, so this is a UCA collaborative study done in 1992 where the 185 patient uh, babies were randomized to equally to ECMO or a conventional care. And this shows significantly improved uh, benefit with ECMO compared to the conventional mode. Where out of 93, 63 pay, uh, babe, uh, neonates were survived up to one year without a severe disability. In conventional group, only 37 survived up to one year. So that kind of established the uh, ECMO standard of care in neonatal respiratory failure. So if you look at uh, ELSO data, so so far there were 30, 
So 31,000, more than 31,000 neonates are put on ECMO for the uh, respiratory point of view. And that is the largest number so far. So until adult, in until, so 2010, uh, when they, uh, so 2009, when the uh, H1N1 pandemic started, that, until then, uh, adults uh, were not that much. It was the predominantly the neonates which were going on ECMO. And overall uh, outcome rate is 73% uh, is the, the best um, outcome compared to any other age group, even now. So if you look at the um, numbers, the number of runs which are done in the near center in each year wise, so it was maximum in the 1992, so it slowly started coming down. So this is mainly because as Sunil has said, so the neonatal intensive care got better and better. And the invention, the so addition of an inhaled nitric oxide actually decreased the need for ECMO support. So the less and less number of patients are going on ECMO with a, a good intensive care in inhaled nitric oxide. So this is the number of uh, runs of ECMO from all age group if you look at so in the 1990s, the predominantly neonatal respiratory ECMO was almost 80%. And main uh, reason for was the mechanism aspiration with uh, pulmonary hypertension. And as the time goes by, so the neonatal respiratory ECMO number has significantly come down. And now the predominant number is the adults, adult respiratory and adult cardiac, which is in gray and um, a green color. So adult numbers are completely better. So this all started from 2009 onwards. If you look at from here, adult numbers have gone up significantly. So in 2009, the H1N1 pandemic came and at the similar time, the CSER trial also was published, which showed uh, the ECMO was useful in adult respiratory failure. Another big group is taken up is uh, adult cardiac as well, which is happening in a big way. So if you take up the only neonatal cases by diagnosis, uh, uh, in the early um, eight, sort, of, sort of late 80s, so early 90s, it was predominantly the mechanism aspiration, which is an orange in color, and that number has slowly come down because of the the, near, uh, the perinatal care getting in better and better. The, the number of babies born with a, a mechanism aspiration is less and less. Uh, so the other other groups, which includes the uh, probably cardiacs, are significantly um, are there. Another big group is, which is a significant group, is a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. So with the mechanism aspirations coming, becoming less and less, uh, the diaphragmatic hernias are taking the more proportion comparatively. And our situations in India, uh, where the, the cesarean sections are predominantly happening more than the normal deliveries, so we hardly see any babies with mechanism aspiration these days. So if you look at the initial mode of ECMO uh, uh, for the respiratory support, uh, predominantly still veno arterial mode of ECMO throughout the worldwide. And then it's almost two thirds is uh, veno arterial mode of ECMO and one third is a veno venous mode of ECMO. So even, so for our situation, we do not have the uh, venous cannulas, WML venous cannulas, but even in the Western countries, some centers, they still believe uh, and we not till mode of ECMO even for the respiratory reason, but that is slowly changing. Um, so if you look at the near end diagnosis with the survival from 2014, so CDH is kind of 50% survival. And if you look at the mechanism aspiration, which is the biggest survival rate, almost 92%. And that's what Sunil Sarah said. So if you any mechanism aspiration, if you put on early on ECMO, by fourth or fifth day, they'll come off ECMO. And the PPHN is 73% survival, and sepsis 50% survival, air leaks 89% survival, and others are almost like nearly 70% survival. The same thing, a similar one is say, showing over a period of time from sort of late 80s to until 2018, and the diagnosis wise, the outcome has probably not changed much. Uh, kind of, this is a red one in mechanism aspiration, which is kind of around. Uh, 70 to 80 percent, and the green one, so the blue one, which is a congenital diaphragmatic error, around 50 percent. So, in over a period of time, it has not changed much. So, 
So coming back to our patients, our baby, babe, we put on ECMO, we not, so we put the baby on veno arterial mode of ECMO. So what it was started with as a, a, we started for mechanism aspiration, lungs got better, but baby got worse with the sepsis. So that is the reason we had to actually extend the ECMO for 13 days. And uh, we were able to come off on 13th day and the uh, baby was continued on ventilation for further four, four more days and extubated. And then uh, because of the sepsis, baby developed a few other complications like um, uh, conjugated jaundice, so for which we had to actually do exchange transfusion. So baby came out of uh, ECMO, so was discharged at one month of life. Uh, but good thing was baby uh, neurological outcome was normal. So this is uh, when the baby went on ECMO and this is uh, just before coming off ECMO on day 13. Just extend got significantly better. So just to conclude, so ECMO is a standard of care in neonatal respiratory failure where it is refracted to the conventional modes of treatment. And early intervention before end organ damage happens should be considered because neonatal, uh, neonatal just still many people are not aware of ECMO being available in India. I think one thing what we need to consider is to spread the word to the, all the neonatal intensive care where they cannot support the babies and shift the babies early, uh, early enough for before end organ damage happens so that ECMO can be considered. And uh, we know arterial mode of ECMO is predominantly what we can offer at this stage, but if somebody has a cannulas available, certainly consider vena venous mode of ECMO. Uh, and even if it's a vena venous mode, uh, probably cut down would be better, or at least semi cellinger technique is better for line insertion. And do take into account specific challenges for the coagulation system with immature coagulation system and uh, uh, risk of interventricular hemorrhage in neonates. And all the babies who go on ECMO, they would need long-term neurodevelopmental follow-up at least until five years of age. And then at least the first, uh, first year of life every three months and then yearly afterwards. So this is our baby who went on ECMO. So he is now uh, Five-year-old is this is on the first day of his going to school. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, and uh, uh, last Sunil sir, if anything to be added, please. Thanks, Randa. Are there any questions? Just one clarification. Uh, Nanda explained that worldwide we go for veno arterial ECMO in the neonatal period than veno venous ECMO. The reason for this is non-availability of cannulae worldwide. Um, so this uh, Avalon cannula is not designed for less than 13 French size. Thir uh, 13 French size is, avail is the suitable size for a three month old baby. So anybody from three, mo three months of age or more than that can go Below that, if you want to put a baby, a newborn baby on ECMO, it always happens to be veno arterial ECMO as it stands now. Future might be different, but currently we don't have Avalon cannula, uh, which is smaller than 13 print size. Any questions? Good evening, sir. Good evening. I have two questions uh, regarding the ECMO supports in the neonates. Uh, what are the initial settings for the neonates? Is this the same as adults or are any different? Let me go for uh, neonates. We go for it with a veno venous ECMO 100 ml per kilo as the total volume we'll be going for and on the flow as far as the flow is concerned. And uh, veno. Uh, ml per kilo as well. Principles are the same. Start slowly going up on the ECMO flow. Daily. And this is one reason is if you have hemolyzed blood with high potassium in that, as the baby's blood volume is low, the damage hemolyzed blood can cause in a baby is much, much higher. In my personal experience, I have seen one baby having a cardiac arrest, and the reason was secondary to hyperkalemia. That 
so just be mindful about the potassium you are uh, in uh, you, you have got in the blood you are transfusing to the baby uh, when the baby is on uh, on on ecmo so that is a very important fact but apart from that going on to ecmo increasing the flows coming down they are they are all we don't tend to uh, keep below 10 revolutions per minute because at very sluggy circulation clots can form in the circuit as well so we have to be mindful about that thank you sir uh, my second question is how we go on the ventilatory raised ventilatory setting is just again it is same as adults or any change and the heparin doses surprisingly it is the same as adults it is uh, current as the current knowledge stands uh, peak inspiratory pressure of uh, 20 peak end expiratory pressure of 10 rate of 10 inspiratory time of 1 second for all age groups as it is now uh, we expected some guidance to come from olio trial but uh, in this particular con con the uh, information from that with respect to um heparinization same once again but you use less uh, less amount of heparin for the concentration so it's like 5000 units of heparin in 100 ml of saline whereas in uh, adults you go for 25000 units in 100 ml of saline like that so proportionately yes. the amount of uh, heparin you add will be less in for uh, you know, for babies right. but the desired numbers are the same ect is at the same okay and what is the sweep gas yeah. and the flow yeah. ratio yeah as for the changing numbers people are concentrating less and less on the anti thrombin 3 said neonates have got a deficiency anti thrombin 3 that is right the, but the current message is uh, to use as much heparin as you need to achieve your desired uh, act numbers and you don't necessarily need to supplement anti thrombin 3 sir i missed your other question sweep gas and the flow ratio same Same as adult. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And any other specific investigations in routine, or is just same as adult? They are also the same. Ultrasonogram because you have access to uh, anterior fontanella. We recommend it has to be done on daily basis, daily or alternate day, or definitely whenever there is some change. Sizes, it has to be done. Ideally, it is recommended. Ultrasound has to be done on daily basis. Okay, thank you, sir. Nanda, do you want to add anything? Yeah, yes, I think uh, pretty much you covered everything, sir. Uh, in terms of ventilation, um, I think what you said is rest ventilation settings the same, but in case if the Lung is air leaking or uh, significant air leak is there, then sometimes you may need to come down those ventilator settings or uh, to very minimal, like CPAP, maybe just. That's right. Sir, as you said that in neonates, uh, the ratio of ECMO is almost equal. Either it is VA or VV. so i would like to know sir what are the vessels which are selected in vv and uh, what are the vessels which are selected commonly in va ecmo sir das would you mind to repeat your question please you are not very clear sir suppose we have uh, we either select vv ecmo or va ecmo in neonate patient uh if yeah. va ecmo has been selected what are the vessels we choose and when vv is selected what are the vessels we usually choose commonly choose right so in neonates 
uh, anterior uh, in internal jugular mm, and uh, we have to go for internal carotid as arterial choice that is fixed because not enumerated in uh, neo even up two years of age group femoral vessels are not well developed so never ever try to cannulate femoral vessels in a um, baby less than two years of, uh, two years of age with that because they are not well developed so you have very limited vascular access here internal jugular is a commonest one one is experience they can and uh, um, they, they can access uh, subclavian maybe they can try that but in general and in common practice it tends to be internal jugular uh, don't go for the lower limb vessels and with the arterial internal carotid artery don't go for the femoral vessels what if we have chosen dv ecmo in neonates sir or we don't choose it because vessels are not developed when you are desperate in choosing for for neonatal ecmo the it is again the internal jugular uh, origen cannula is available in a 12 12 range but i am not completely satisfied with origen because it is not as stiff as avalon if you use excessive negative pressure it is likely that both the lumens can come together they are not as by reinforced as uh, avalon cannula that's what i mean by this uh, it is still soft and it is it is bendy as well but if you are bent upon using it uh, 12 french origen cannula is available not from avala that that is one way of doing it in uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernias uh, cannulation tend to be very very difficult because because of the hernial content of the um, chest the vessels are dis they don't tend to exist in the normal places so actually cannulating diaphragmatic hernia babies is a nightmare they have hypoplastic vessels and they have displaced vessels also so one has to be extremely talented uh, to cannulate the baby the other option is if you are unsuccessful with peripheral ecmo central ecmo as a routine i don't recommend it but that would be the last choice if you certainly want to place a baby and ecmo uh, for uh, results are cardiac baby for example initially our practice has been for 48 hours you can watch on central cannulation and after 48 hours because of the infection risk and because of the bleeding risk etc it is better to uh, change on to peripheral ecmo okay thank you sir sir one more question uh, any specific age group to cannulate the femoral cannula or any specific weight in uh, the pediatric age group two years of age beyond two years of age it amounts to around 10 kilos okay, more than 10 kilos sir yes sir. more than 10 kilos and two years of age thank you sir so it means sir uh, baby of meconium aspiration syndrome are usually put on va ecmo since their body weight is very low they are they come in all sizes meconium aspiration syndrome is less frequently in preterm babies too but most babies so if the baby's weight is close to 4 kilos you one can try with 13 french cannula but if it is below 4 kilos or 3 kilos for example 2.5 kilos 3 kilos then the vessels do not admit a 13 french w men cannula internal jugular so that is a reason to go for veno arterial ecmo in a 2.5 or 3 kilo babies but if it is a 4 kilo baby yes you can try um, 13 french
ओके थैंक यू सर थैंक यू सर right uh, pranay asked me to check with all of you when should we have our next meet this august is a holiday and the initial meeting on that day or postpone it to the week after wait to week after sir yeah i agree with that and i will convey the same message to uh, pranay if there are no objections to that yes sir i also agree that in that week monday is also 